And uh, today I'm going to be talking about uh, the prophet Joel. How many have heard of the prophet Joel in the Old Testament? Uh, we're also going to be talking a little bit about two days in the life of a people. And the people that I'm referring to uh, is Israel, of course, and specifically the tribe of Judah. And uh, what I want to talk a little bit about first is the history of this uh, lesson that I'm going to share with you this morning. And so first of all, the prophet, the prophet Joel is prophet to Judah. Uh, and he wrote to warn people against leaving their faith in God. What had happened is uh, they had become prosperous and complacent. And very often in life, when we have all the stuff that we need, when we have all of the material things that are surround us, and we have a little extra of, uh, money at the end of the month, and we're able to do what we need to do, and, and maybe we even enjoy some prosperity, sometimes uh, that can breed a sense of complacency. And that certainly had happened in the people of Judah. Judah is one of the 12 tribes of Israel. Uh, Joel writes to Judah and people everywhere to, everywhere to urge them back to their relationship with God. Now, I want to pause for a moment to say that all of our journeys in a relationship with God is unique and individual in many ways. When I say the word God, we can conjure all kinds of meaning up in our brains, but we have finite minds, and it's literally impossible for us to have a full grasp, full and complete concept of who God is. But we come together in places like this, and we have relationships with a variety of people, and very often people experience this spiritual walk differently than you and I. For us to, to assume or to presume that people who are on a genuine faith discovery journey experience it exactly like we do is erroneous. And that means that we put God into a very small box. How many realize that God cannot be contained within a box? Certainly he is bigger than we are, and thank God he is bigger than we are, because who would want to serve a God who had the brain that was equal to ours? That just wouldn't work, would it? So in our journey of discovering faith, it is a lifetime of discovering what is true and maybe branching out into directions that, that's not necessarily true, and then we come back to the path. And the whole of life is tr truly in its most important uh, phase about discovering spiritual truth. And I'm very glad that God has placed within every human being a measure of faith so that when God speaks to us in the various ways that he does, we can hear truth and understand truth and continue to walk our journey of faith. Now, a sidebar, and I don't want to spend much time on this, Christians are notorious. Churches are notorious for kicking people out of their rank and file if they don't measure up to the exact line of belief that we embrace in a congregation like this. And we are an open and affirming church, correct? And so we openly and accept all people coming through these doors so that we might be able to share the incomparable love of God with them. We don't try to, to force them to become exactly like us in our journey because God's big enough to help us become who we need to become. It's not about everyone lining up with our assessment of who God is, because remember, our assessment is smaller than truly how God is. And what I just want to start as a foundation in this message today is to say, do not be afraid of people who believe something slightly different than you do. If God is calling us, as the song declared in our worship time, then let God be God in people's lives, and he will complete what he has started in us, so says Scripture. So anyway, Joel is, is writing to this people, and he is beckoning them and calling them back into this relationship with God because basically they had kind of walked away because of their prosperity. They had become complacent. But I want to start with a key verse, which is very positive. It's kind of the climax of this message. I want to start with it today. That says, I will pour out my spirit on every kind of people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. I'll even pour out my spirit upon the servants, or on the servants, men and women both. 
and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now notice that it doesn't say everyone who subscribes to the statement of beliefs at Open Door Ministries will be saved. Personally, I'm glad that it doesn't say that. Even though I subscribe to the statement of belief, But it says, everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. We do our best in life to establish spiritual organizations to to enable people to come and to experience God and to learn about God and to move forward with God. But the key thing that we need to remember is that as God pours his spirit out on all people, they will be compelled to call upon God in their hour of need, and whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, I'm very glad that it's not up to you and me to decide who gets in and who doesn't. It's really God's choice, because God sees the heart. I cannot see your heart, and you cannot see mine. And we have the ability to have all kinds of things in here that never become out there. And so we cannot accurately judge people, which is why Jesus said, do not judge. Do not judge. Everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And if God's fine with that, you know what? I'm okay with that too. Is that all right? So now we're going to be talking about two days that the people of Judah experienced. One was a day of locusts. Have anybody seen that many locusts anywhere? I've read stories about it, and I've heard about it in the Dust Bowl in Central, uh, Amer- Central, the central part of the U.S. I've heard of all kinds of stories, and it's even happened when we've been alive, where they've had locusts come through and sweep through a, a farming community and just strip everything that's green totally gone. Well, this happened in uh, the book of that. Uh, Joel talks about. But also he talks about the day of the Lord. These are the two days that he speaks about. So what had happened is in Joel 1 and part of 2, the the day of the locusts come because the place of worship had been abandoned. They had walked away from their commitment to God and they had just done their own thing. And we all know, if you're part of this church or you've been here a few times, you'll understand that, that my invitation to people is that God is always wanting to be in relationship with us. Sometimes we don't think God wants to be in relationship with us because we think that he may be fickle like many of our family and friends are, and they place conditions on our relationship with him. But God is not like that. God wants to be in our life, and God wants us to be in his life. People had walked away from God because they didn't have a need for God. And so what Joel says, what God speaks through the prophet Joel, is tell my people to lament, to come and change their attitudes, and to come back to the place of worship, because I miss the relationship with the people that I've created. He says, return to me and change your life. You've just decided to go your own way, and I want you to come back to me, is what God is saying. So what is happening is that Israel is heading over a cliff and God decides to step in. Now you probably will relate to this because many of us have life experiences where we feel like we are free falling over a cliff with no apparatus to save us. Israel is in this condition. And what does God do? He gets their attention with a big bunch of grasshoppers. That's what locusts are. I think it's kind of interesting that he doesn't send lions and tigers that kill everybody. God was not interested in wiping them off of the face of the earth. He just wanted to annoy them a little bit. So they would refocus and say, oh, that's right. I need to be paying attention to God in my life. God isn't out to get you. He just wants you to come into fellowship and relationship with him is what he wants. And when we head over our cliffs in life that mean we're walking away from God intentionally or even unintentionally, we discover soon that God may be sticking some things into our lives that cause a little discomfort, so we'll, get a, we'll, we'll, be, uh, we'll pay attention and we'll discover again his love for us. So the locust invasion is actually a wake-up call. He's telling the people, God through the prophet Joel is saying, wake up. 
people and get in touch with what the real, what the real reality is. It's not your world, it's the kingdom. And so he says, trumpet the alarm, God's judgment is on its way. Before it arrives, the country is like the Garden of Eden. When it leaves, it's Death Valley. People panic, invaders charge, nothing stops them. They storm the city, they sweep through like a tornado, and who can possibly survive this? He's talking again about locusts, and, and this whole chapter of two really puts descriptive words into this army of locusts that is really creating a stir in Judah's world. He goes on to say, change your life. It's not too late. Come back to me and really mean it. Come fasting and weeping, sorry for your sins. Rend your hearts, not your garments. Come back to God. And here's why. God is kind. He is merciful. This most patient God, extravagant in love, always ready to cancel catastrophe. Maybe he'll do it now. Maybe when it's all said and done, there will be a blessing or there will be blessings full and robust for your God. Now, I want to pay attention to a moment to this part that says, rend your heart and not your garments. In Old Testament scripture and in New Testament scripture, there was kind of a, a practice where you'd rip your clothes like dramatically if you, were, if you were sorrowful about something. And so what ended up happening, we as human beings do this, it seems like often in life, where we just create an external drama so people can kind of experience the external drama. And what God was saying is that you, you are rending your garments and putting a show for people to see, and what you really need to do is rend your hearts. What you really need to do is humble your heart and break your heart open to be authentic and honest with God instead of just making a show of it and let people think, oh my gosh, they are really spiritual over there because look at the display that they're putting on. He's saying the heart of the matter is the heart, not the outside. And I love the fact that he draws attention again to God who is kind and merciful and patient. How many of you at some time in your life had an opposite view of God than that? Have all of us at one time or another thought God was a big bully with a club and he's just waiting you to, for you to step out of line and, and he's going to beat you up with it? Well, that's not God at all. God is merciful. Part of the reason we sometimes think that is because there's a lot of church people saying things like that to us. And it's not true. God is kind. God is kinder than any human being that I know of. God is kinder and more patient than any human being, period. And he loves us. He is merciful. And so then he continues, don't be afraid, be glad and celebrate. God has done great things, a bumper crop of figs and vines. He's giving you a teacher to train you how to live right, teaching like rain out of heaven, showers of words to refresh and nourish your soul, and plenty of food for your body. I will repay you for the years the locusts have eaten. You'll be full of praises to your God, the God who has set you back on your heels in wonder. The wonderful thing about this story, and I'm going to get to the, the, the final thoughts about this story in just a moment after we get through the story, but it's wonderful here that after the locusts come in, and they strip the land bare. It's like the Garden of Eden beforehand, and it's like Death Valley afterwards. Anything that could be eaten was eaten by this army of locusts. And you know good and well they were in their homes, too. They were everywhere. There was no peace and no, uh, no place to get away from them at all. But after they have destroyed everything that is within that land, he says, I will repay you for the years the locusts have eaten. In our lives, there are times that we go through things and they are taken from us, are they not? We feel like we have this ambition and this goal and this desire and we wanted very much to move in a certain direction, but we feel like we were robbed of, of our future. We were robbed of an education. We didn't get to do what we thought we wanted to because of annoyances in life or because of circumstances and situations not unlike this locust army that came in and devastated Judah. 
God has promised us, even as, as long ago as 28 centuries ago, which is when Joel lived and ministered, that if, the, if your life feels desolate as a result of an army that has come in to be against you and everything that you've decided to do, that God promises, I will repay you. For the years the locusts have eaten. Never give up on your dreams, folks. Never believe it's too late to accomplish and to, to, uh, to uh, acquire what God has desired to pour into your life. Because it's never too late. He will repay us for the years the locusts have eaten. And then the second day is the day of the Lord. And that's just the beginning. He says, after I've restored everything that you've lost, after that, I will pour out my spirit on every kind of people. This is what I started with in this message. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. I'll even pour out my spirit on the servants, men and women both. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now, you can very well be sure that the audience that, were, that was hearing these words out of Joel's mouth, if they were women, they were probably very skeptical of this being said. Because in Joel's day, women had little value. They were not, it, there was not an emphasis of, of equality the way there is in our world today. And so he's saying servants would have been, would have been even slaves. That servants and, and women and men, that everybody will, be, will receive this outpouring of the Holy Spirit and that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. I love that everyone. If you ever feel like you don't belong, like you're not good enough, like, you're not, you're, like God doesn't care about you, you can go back as far as 28 centuries ago and hear God speaking to a people through a prophet. And we are speaking today the same message that whoever, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now I want to digress or take a, an aside here for a little while. I had a very unusual experience uh, this last week. I had three dreams. I had a dream on Sunday night, a dream on Monday night, and a dream on Tuesday night. I've been pastoring this church. It was three and a half years, maybe a little over three and a half years the first time. It's been almost two years now. And in five and a half years or so of ministry in this church, I don't think I've ever shared a dream with you that I've dreamed. But three nights, it was so... I mean, half the time, I don't remember my dreams, but three nights in a row to have a dream and to be able to tie them together and know that I've experienced this, I knew God was speaking to me in my dreams. And, of course, we just read the scripture that your old men will dream dreams. <laughs> I had uh, BibleGateway.com on my computer, and it's got a list this long of different translations and paraphrases of scripture and I looked that verse up everywhere and the only thing that I could find that was different than your old men will dream dreams was your elderly would dream dreams. I was trying to think of somebody who'd put it in a different way but I guess I'm an old man. Your old man was dreaming dreams. So I'm going to tell you these three dreams. I'm going to share them with you. My first dream, I was descending into a brilliantly white and light narrowing cave. I wasn't, it was a positive experience, and it was descending, and the sides of the cave were irregular, and it was narrowing, and as I got further and further down, I somehow realized that I was in a birth canal, that I was getting ready to come into a spiritual awakening, or a spiritual truth and life or even passing from this life to the next. I don't exactly know literally what that meant, except for when I got very close to the very end, I could see throughout uh, the end, the opening at the end, and it was blue like a blue sky, beautiful blue, and yet it was very, very narrow. And I reached my hand down and I saw a shelf with a name on it. And I placed my hands on the shelf and I felt secure and I realized that that name represented the word. That God had spoken to me saying that this word, when you hold on to the word, you may feel compressed on every single side. You're in a, the process of being born into a new wide and open space. Don't be afraid and go through there. I'm a little claustrophobic. I'm quite claustrophobic. In a situation like that, I would be going nuts. But as soon as I touched this 
shelf that had a word on it, and it was a written out word. I didn't know what it meant, and I can't even tell you what it was. It didn't make any sense to me, but I grabbed onto it, and immediately I felt peace. I realized also that this was, this was like labor. I was coming through an opening, and I knew that it was going to be difficult for me, but the reward was going to be well worth it. That was my first dream. The second dream, I walked into an area that seemed wooded. It was dark. Uh, it, was, it was day, but there was a forest of trees, and the, the sky was completely covered by the, by the forest. And as I walked, I saw a man who was about knee or thigh deep in mud, totally still and could not move. It was a vivid dream. And when I walked by him, I could see the panic in his eyes. He was afraid and felt vulnerable because he could not move. And I just walked by, unsure of what that meant. That was, that was, mon uh, two, that was Monday night. So Sunday night was the first dream. Two, uh, Monday night was this dream. And then my third dream was really pretty amazing. There was a man and a woman who were lying down next to each other. And I realized that it was actually like a coroner's office. The table that they were laying on was a metal table like a table that you do autopsies on. I'd been to the LA County morgue and the coroner's office there. It was a wide table because there were two people laying next to each other. The man was fully clothed and awake. And I remember touching him on the shoulder, partly to try to stir him, because he had a, an expression on his face that was, there was an absence of fear, but he was still, his eyes were open. And he didn't respond to my touching. My, my touching his shoulder was to try to console him in one way, but also to stir him. And I walked around the table and to the other side where the woman was lying. She was fully wrapped in her body, all the way covering her mouth but her eyes were there. When I looked at her at first, she seemed lifeless to me, completely lifeless. And as I walked around to her side, she opened her eyes and looked at me, and I realized she was alive. I want to give you the interpretation of this dream. They were all tied together in one way, and I want to share it with you. The goal in sight was the, was the message in that first dream, that many of us on our spiritual path are in this birth canal, so to speak, and we are moving through life, and we are getting closer and closer, and maybe we feel the confinement around us, but we're holding on to the truth of God. We see the truth and where it's leading us, and we're, we're going to get there. We're intentional, we're filled with purpose, we're moving there, and life is a joy and exciting in the process. The second dream, again, reflected a spiritual journey in that somebody was stuck in life by the cares of this world. The, the earth in a dream signifies, obviously, material, and there are people on their spiritual journey who are stuck in life, and they don't know what to do. They feel vulnerable, and they feel no direction spiritually. And they were arrested in their development, and they were unable to move. Fully alive, standing, but unable to move. And the third dream, I believe that the man represented somebody whose senses had been dulled. He seemed like he was drugged in some way, but his eyes were open. And he did not understand the danger of his situation being in a room that represented spiritual death in my dream. He was content without God. And the woman, on the other hand, was bound and near spiritual death entirely. These dreams came one night after another, and I don't even know why. It, I didn't decide that I was going to share them with you until midweek this week. This has been going on over in my mind completely. But what I want to share with you in the dreams that also comes from the book of Joel is what God provides for us. Joel says, I will pour out my spirit on every kind of people. And people, regardless of where we are on our spiritual path, if we are awakened and, al and alive and engaged and we're moving through that place of transformation and we're almost there 
and, it's, and we feel vitally alive in that process, God is present. If you're a person who feels stuck in life, God doesn't want us to remain stuck and vulnerable and without the ability to move forward. He wants us to move forward. God has life for us. God has hope for us. God wants to fill us with joy, not for us to be stuck in the muck and mire of the world around us without feeling a sense of hope and without experiencing the transformation that God desires for us. If we are not even considering the spiritual path, if we're just not awake to spirituality at all, and there's very little life there, God wants to pour out his spirit upon us, and he will never leave us in even those near-death situations. He wants to bring us to the vitality of his life. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Whether you're in this room or you're listening to this by video on Facebook or YouTube or LinkedIn or any of the other ways that you can hear this, God's message to us is that no matter what condition of our, what the condition or our spiritual journey is, to call on him, to look to him, and to allow him to provide for us. And this is the takeaway of my message today. God is an immovable force in your path, not for your judgment, not for your harm, but for your good. I tell the story occasionally about a young three-year-old that wandered out into into the roadway in front of his house, and, and the child is just happily moving around and totally oblivious to the danger that faces him. It's a totally different world out there that he's not aware of. And he just runs out, and the mother who's nearby runs and grabs the child and and pushes the child out of the way before a car runs over it and crushes the life out of it. And the only thing the child knows is the child has just been accosted by this mother who is supposed to love him and has gone hurling across the road not understanding what happened. Sometimes God moves us through our path and we feel like God is harming us and experiencing, we are experiencing harm at the hand of God and it probably is very likely that God just moved us out of the way because there was a bus coming to destroy you. And when we are awake spiritually and we see what God is doing in our lives, we understand that even the hurts in life, the difficulties in life, even when they seem that we suffer them at the hand of God, are there for our good. God is an immovable force who is for you, not against you. And you'll never be able to get away from him. He loves you. second takeaway is give God more attention. I don't know where you are in this, but as I've talked about from joy, our our theme for 2013 is the joy of the Lord will make you strong. We want joy. We want strength. We want to have the courage to live our lives. And the way that happens, partly the way to begin this is to give God more of your attention. Periodically, I'm on the sofa, and I'm playing words with friends. And you know who's sitting next to me, playing words with friends? Eric. Once in a while, we put our phones down, and we actually pay attention to each other. How many times do we walk through life And this gets our attention, and that gets our attention, and that gets our attention, and that gets our attention. We fall into bed exhausted, and we, we, the day goes by, day after day after day, and we've never once even thought about God. If you love somebody, and they love you, there are times you want them to look you in the eyes and tell you, right? How many are here with somebody that loves you and you love them and you'll be fine if they never tell you again? We want to hear that. And let me tell you, God 
brings his life force inside of us when we pause for a moment and we just acknowledge him. In our thoughts, you don't even have to say a word. Give God more attention. The day of the Lord or the day of locusts, it's really up to us. You know, the locusts would have never come if the, if the house of God that represented worship in this people, if they had not ignored that, there would have never been any locusts. Sometimes the catastrophes that we experience in life are because we've just ignored the lover of our soul, God. Identify your spiritual condition. Are you that person who is vitally engaged and you know that you're, in a, you're passing through in the gestation period of your spirituality and the womb was for that purpose and you're nearing a, a new birth experience and life is going to unfold and the world is going to open up and you're going to be so surprised at what's there. But you know it's coming. You see glimpses of it. You have dreams maybe. You're, you're moving toward this truth and reality. Identify your spiritual condition. Maybe you identified with a person stuck in the mud. You just feel like life happens day in and day out, and you just can't get anywhere. You can't get on top of your bills. You can't get on top of your relationship. You can't get on top of anything, and you're just stuck. You can't remain there without eventually feeling lifeless. If that describes your spiritual condition, call upon the name of the Lord, and he will deliver you. If you are in a spiritual condition that is far more desperate than that, in a room that represents death, wake up. And let us, again, invite God into our space, into us. That's where he wants to be. And you'll discover life. Transformation is what we're all headed towards. Instead of being stuck, instead of being content in life without God. And then finally, advance by thinking about God in all things. Do you know there's a scripture that says, in all things, give thanks? In all things, give thanks? Pastor Dan, are you telling me that that somebody just walked out of my life and I'm really in the dumps right now that I'm supposed to give thanks? In all things, give. There's no exceptions to this. When we give thanks, we are acknowledging that our problem is not without the presence of an eternal loving God who invests in us to help us get through our problems. Let me tell you, problems come and go. And that's just life. My mother and father lived their life together their entire life, married almost 56 years when my father died. And it didn't truly dawn on me that all the problems that my mom and dad had as a married couple that I was very privy to as their son, that when that ended, when that relationship ended, that my mother was going to have a whole new life to deal with being absent her partner of 56 years. It never stops. If we don't find hope in something that is not material, including our relationships, including our jobs and our bank accounts, and no matter what security we try to hold on to, if we can't find security in something that cannot be affected by this material world, we will always be the victim of our circumstances. Advance your life and your spiritual development by thinking about God. And you may be here today saying, I don't even know if God exists. And that's fine. No judgment here. I've talked with some people who attend our church. They haven't even answered that, or they have not answered that question. I, I'm not speaking in any condescending manner at all when I say this. Give God a chance. Sit alone for a few minutes. Give God a chance. Ask him to prove who, himself, and to pu- prove that he is real. He's for us, and he wants to do that. Our band is coming. Would you stand? I'd like to...